Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight on our True Adventure series, we welcome back, after an absence of almost a year, the American who lives and works in Bogota, Colombia, and spends his spare time in the primitive regions of South America, Mr. Hector Athebus. Now, in one of his previous appearances, we learned that the Hevero headhunters gave him the nickname Ningi Waikama, meaning he who journeys alone. And he hasn't changed his desire to go alone on the trail of adventure, as we're going to see in the next 30 minutes. Our true story adventure features the return of Ningi Waikama. Bold Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure. To begin tonight's true story adventure is Jack Douglas. I'm sure that not many of us have had the chilling experience of visiting a strange town only to be asked upon our arrival how soon we could be expected to leave. Well, our soft-spoken senor from Bogota was confronted with this exact discomforting situation when he entered the village of the Kogi Indians of Colombia, a tribe of Indians who not only know the value of gold, but live in suspicious fear that every newcomer to their village may really be after their solid gold artifacts. This is but one of the many interesting highlights of tonight's colorful journey to Colombia, documented by the young man who makes his home in this nearby South American Republic, Mr. Hector Athebus, formerly of New York City. Hello, Mr. Athebus. It's nice to see you again. Thank you, Jack. I'm very glad to be back. Well, now, recalling some of your past appearances on our series, Mr. Athebus, you seem to have a knack for seeking out and finding the unusual and the bizarre. And tonight, it's the gold-hoarding Kogi Indians. Now, how did you find out about these Indians? Well, I have a, an ethnologist uh, friend who wrote uh, a work about them, and I uh, read his work, and then I heard from many people uh, very interesting stories, so I decided to go in and find out for myself. Natural enough, certainly, for you. Now, I mentioned earlier, Mr. Thebus, that uh, no sooner had you arrived at the village of the Kogi Indians, but what the chief asked you when you were going to leave. I wonder if you'd recall the incident and tell us just how it happened. Well, after many days of traveling, we finally arrived to their main village. And when I got off my mule and went over to the chief to say hello, he looked me over very disdainfully and said, when are you leaving? They are very suspicious of strangers. All right, Mr. Athebus, or Ningi Waikama, as the Hebrew headhunters would say, suppose we begin our journey and just where does it start? I started this trip from my home in Bogota, and the Plains or Llanos of Colombia was my first objective. The entrance into the Llanos really starts after you have crossed the Meta River. The river banks are of soft mud, and logs must be laid down to prevent us from sinking in. It almost seems as if you'd put most of the household belongings atop that car, Mr. Athebus. I did, Jack. During the summer months or dry season, the river goes dry, but the meta is one of the few which has to be crossed always with the ferry boat. The ferry boat, when it breaks down, might take several days to be fixed because the parts have to come from Bogota. And this is very annoying when you arrive at the bank of the river and find that you have to stick around for several days before you can cross it. The last civilized outpost is Puerto Gaitan. At this little village, I gassed up for the last time. We not only filled our tank, but also spare drums, which we carried on the roof of the car. This was the last place I could be sure of getting gasoline for the rest of the trip. This is also one reason why I use this small car, which uses very little fuel. The Llanos, or Plains of Colombia, extend all the way from the foot of the Andes to the Orinoco River and are like the Pampas of Argentina, or perhaps like your own Plains of the Midwest. However, strangely, there is one section of my route of these small hills. The Serrania, so-called because of the contrast with the rest of the terrain, which is completely flat. That almost looks like volcanic rock or ash of some kind. No, I don't think they are of volcanic origin. I don't know how they are formed. It's very strange. The small car I was using on this trip had a rough going at times, and maybe I should have given it easier treatment. I was sorry later. 
About 150 miles in the interior, the car broke down, and I looked about myself, and all I was able to see was a sea of dry straw. As far as the eye could see, nothing. I knew I was in an area where there were large farms, and somebody was bound to come along this way. I climbed to... <laughs> well, uh, there was nothing much I could do then there to repair it, so I climbed to the roof of my car and waited for someone to come along out of this big space. Sure enough, help was on the way, welcome enough, even though it was just a little girl. She had a mule and a funny little cart. Well, if that was a cart, it certainly is the most unusual thing we've ever seen of its type. Well, I never did really find out what they used it for. She thought it pretty funny when I suggested that we tie the cart to the cart. But the combination of that little girl, the mule, and me did the trick. I pushed the car, not so much to help the mule, but in order to keep the cart from falling apart. We finally arrived at a gate, which turned out to be the entrance to her father's farm. You'd call this a ranch in your country. They raise cattle. This was a very lucky break for you, wasn't it? Well, it was, Jack, because otherwise I'd still be stranded out there. I soon found myself with comforts I had not expected. This was a large cattle breeding ranch, and steak was on the menu in all meals. This is real ranchero hospitality, like the old Spanish days, maybe, in California. Here I left my car to wait for spare parts from Bogota. As it happened, there was an animal trader missing in this area. Early the next morning, we loaded the mules in a patch of jungle and set out to try to find him. The farmer had told me he was in an area about 50 miles from the farm. I had heard of this trader at my home in Bogota, where he also lived. We worried about him. I wanted to at least try to find him. Now, did you get these animals from the ranch? Yes, Jack. The mm -hmm. farmer not only gave me the two mules, but also was very willing to come with me and accompany me on the whole trip. Is that and you bringing up the rear there? That's right, Jack. <laughs> Although the terrain was flat, the going was wearing because the hot tropical sun rays beat down relentlessly upon us, and there was no jungle to keep the rays away from us, so to say. <laughs> that umbrella is quite the touch, Mr. Thebus. <laughs> well, our first camp was made that afternoon, and my first concern was with the treatment of water for drinking. After boiling and filtering water, it is supposed to be ready for drinking, supposedly free of tropical parasites. Nevertheless, one always manages to pick up a few and take them back to civilization. We continue on our way the next day. Late that afternoon, we reached an Indian hunting camp. Three Indians were staying here. The best way to make friends with any primitive people I have found is to offer them cigarettes. So I did. That was a very skimpy pack you gave them, Mr. Thiefer. Well, <laughs> I was low on my cigarettes. Surely. We asked them about the animal trader. They said he was in the jungle gone a week. Here was good information, a clue. So the next morning, we got ready to continue on our trip. The Indians were willing to come with us and look for the trader and put all my paraphernalia on their backs to take my equipment to their village. The farmer would also go and try to find the animal trader. We would join him later. I don't forget my umbrella. This is one thing I don't want to do without on the plains or in the jungle. After we left my equipment on their village, they took me to the nearby Muko River to travel a few miles by canoe. This was supposed to save us about 10 miles of walking. And as you can understand, Jack, I was all for it, for I was pretty tired by that time of so much walking. We came to a beach where we abandoned the dugout. 
this beach, by the way, was full of little flies and mosquitoes. You don't see them in the picture. On the plains again, we were passing through a lightning burnt area. I saw something moving that from the distance looked as though it might be a snake. One of the Indians shot an arrow and he scored. It was an armadillo, a scavenger, for they feed on dead animals besides insects. The Indians eat them and one of them tied it to the end of his bow and carried it away with him. When we finally met with the farmer, he had a surprise for us. He told us that the animal trader had gone back to Bogota with an anaconda he had caught, but that he himself had gone hunting for one and found a pretty big one and shot it. The skin was valuable to him and he would take it back to the nearest civilized place to sell it. An anaconda is a huge South American snake and this is the biggest I had ever seen. Two of the Indians wouldn't have anything to do with the anaconda because of their belief that their small children would die if they touched it. The third Indian had no children, so I managed to persuade him away from the superstition. The anaconda was pretty heavy. It weighed about 300 pounds. Good grief. And the length was some 18 feet. And since two of the Indians wouldn't even touch it, naturally they wouldn't help us. Of course, these Indians can be a little crafty. Sometimes it's rather nice to have some superstitions that enable one to get out of some work, isn't it? Yes, Jack. Maybe the Indians are smarter than we think. After the car was fixed, I traveled north and into the northern part of Colombia towards the Cogis. Traveling in the dust, my windshield became so dirty it was hard to see. So I solicited the help of this Guajira Indian woman. How is this for super service in the desert? I'm proud of it. I continue on my way to the little village of Dibuya. Dibuya is located on the Caribbean coast of Colombia. Its people dedicate themselves mostly to the raising and care of their banana plantations. I went to the banana plantation to get tree ripened fruit. It was delicious. Two of the kids of the village asked me if they could go into my car. It was quite a novelty to see such a small car. <laughs> I found half of the kids of the village inside of it. The two kids said all were the relatives and they couldn't offend them by not inviting them. This looks a little bit like the old circus act, doesn't it? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Some of them weren't very happy about being taken up, but I was afraid they would get hurt, especially those that were on top. Actually, I like kids very much. I have three of my own back home in Bogota. Oh, there's still a little girl in there. And uh, they even managed to get a pig in, too. <laughs> <laughs> the baby of the crowd even brought her own doll as her guest. The big excitement in Dibuya was the donkey race, and I intended participating in it if I could ever get the donkey off the starting line. But as you can see, Jack, I was having a tough time <laughs> convincing him that we were on a race. They're coming around the second stretch now. They're all youngsters, aren't they? Yes, Jack, all of them. But still, I'm going around in circles. The idea being to go around the town twice, and the winner usually, they give him five pesos. I tried to pull him off the starting line to see if he would get started, but it was too late. This is the home stretch. Actually, all the donkeys at the Buya eat ripe bananas. Maybe this is what makes them bulky. Look at this, Jack. I'm not good enough for him to carry me, but he wants to be my dinner guest. Come on, don't be a sore loser, Mr. Athebus. Give him some. <laughs> well, okay, just to show there's no hard feelings. <laughs> From the village, I could see the mountains of the Coga Indians, La Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, and its snow-capped peaks. 
we had to go along the ocean for about three miles before we turn inland towards the mountains and away from the ocean. When we started on our way to the mountains, I was taking with me two boys and the mules and oxen necessary for all my equipment. We had to take the mules to sea. I think the animals like this, it keeps them cool. Making our first camping site in a jungle clearing. I always carry my own portable stove and as much canned meat as possible. This ensures a balanced diet. We had not eaten during the day so that the meatballs smelled good. We finally started to climb up the mountains and we were glad of this because the temperature was low and the cooling breezes were a great help. The scenery was beautiful. It's just spectacular. What a variety of geography. Yes, Jack, there is a great variety in Colombia. The first and only non-Indian village in the area was Pueblo Viejo, and here I stayed several days while the boys prepared fresh beasts. Oxen are used for cargo beasts, and a girl of the village took care of my laundry while we waited. When the day of departure arrived, we loaded four oxen with all my paraphernalia and got underway. Going along the narrow mountain path, I came to a strange looking bridge. This was engineered by the Kage Indians. It was surprisingly well made. It is braced on either side of the river. The handrails are saplings mounted above the log. I thought good enough for the mule and myself to go over, but the mule wouldn't budge. I got off my mule to inspect it when I convinced myself of its solidity, I tried to convince the mule too. Mules certainly don't understand me. I don't know why. I'm not heavy. I feed them bananas. I keep them in the shade of my umbrella. I guess I just don't have donkey appeal. Finally, I had to go down to the bank of the river and fjord the river. the first Kogi village. There was complete silence and a lack of movement of any kind. There should have been over a hundred Kogis living in this many huts. I figured then that they were afraid I was another gold hunter. So I withdrew and continued on my way to the main Kogi village. I stopped at a turn on the trail to look back. Behind the Kogi village was a great peak called El Plateado, the silvered one. When the light rays hit it at a certain angle, it shines like silver. Actually, there's no silver on that mountain, though. The village seemed to be abandoned. The mystery was these huts looked freshly inhabited. The coggies must be around. It has an almost eerie feeling, doesn't it? It certainly does. Sure enough, below, coggies started to reappear, apparently going about their normal activities. They were avoiding me because certainly I called to them when I entered the village and nobody came out. I decided to give up on these coggies. It would be futile, perhaps even dangerous, if I tried to bring them out. Our trail took us over very high mountains, even above the clouds. One of my guides called this the treasure stone. The non-Indian people claim that it has a door that leads to a treasure hidden by the coggies. It was supposed to be a treasure hidden there by the Indians to keep it away from the Spaniards. All I could make out of the supposed door was a large crack on the surface. Maybe this is where the legend about the Kogi gold started. Only a few miles separated us from our destination. And when we finally reached the main Kogi village, a few Indians came out to greet us. I tried to be friendly on our meeting, but they seemed suspicious of me. Most of the population of the village was gone. Um, that probably was because they heard of my coming. They disliked strangers immensely, especially if they are foreigners. I was shown to a hut that was to be my abode while I stayed there. One of the main characteristics of these Indians is their constant use of coca. Coca leaves are their stimulant. 
The coca is combined with lime, which is kept in those contraptions, which is really a calabash, and taken into the mouth by means of a stick. Look at those faces. Very intelligent, but such poor garments. It doesn't look as though they're rich enough to have gold. I began to think that maybe this talk of gold was just a myth. Yet I knew the early Spanish who were after gold and silver had driven these people up into the mountains. They did have one piece of machinery of their own, a sugar mill. This mill was used for crushing the juice out of the sugar cane for making guarapo, a strong fermented intoxicating liquor. One of the older Indians asked me to borrow my stove and I was very glad to let him play at it. He thought that it converted what he called smelly water into fire. The smelly water, of course, was the gasoline. He was having a tough time and he tried to light it and... <laughs> well, he tried to move every little gadget that he saw on it. When the whole stuff caught fire, he was quite proud of himself. Ah, he said to himself, wonderful, I got water to burn. An Indian was put by my door all the time I remained in the village. He was very friendly, but whenever I went, he followed me. He was my constant companion. Even on my early morning shave, he would be there watching. Always pleasant, but always watchful. One afternoon, I headed towards their holy place. They didn't allow me to enter, so the closest I ever managed to get to this holy meeting place was on a hill behind it. Before leaving, I sat with the chief and promised him I would be back another year. And since they knew I wasn't looking for their gold objects, they would probably show me more of their life. We went back over the long, narrow trail bordered with cliffs. I stopped before I turned to look through the clouds to the land of these odd, cocky people who seemed to be completely happy in their isolation. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Thebus. Now, let's establish some facts. You did not actually see any of this gold that the Kogis are supposed to have, or any objects that you thought might have been made of gold. No, Jack, I did not. And I'd assume that the Kogis did not make any boast that they had any gold. No, they did not. Well, then I think, Mr. Thebus, it would be only natural for me to ask what evidence you have that these Kogis are gold hoarders. Well, uh, several people that uh, have gone in there have uh, come out with some uh, gold objects uh, made by them. And uh, there was a man who uh, stole a gold idol and uh, was uh, killed by the Indians. I see. And you know these as facts, and there's no doubt in your mind that the Kogis do have gold. I have no doubt about it, Jack. I see. Now, while on the subject of the Kogi Indians, we couldn't help noticing in the films just a few moments ago that their dwellings, their structures, were so similar to the African huts that we've seen so often. As a matter of fact, even on one of your previous appearances. Now, do you think, Mr. Athebus, that this African influence probably dates to the Jukas of the Guianas? Yes, I believe so. Uh, as you know, the Guianas are very near to Colombia and probably uh, uh, the uh, word and the way of uh, working things uh, got from one tribe to the other until it reached the uh, Kogis. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Thebus. Once again, you've brought us a most unusual film, a film of some people that we had no previous knowledge of. If we know Ningi Waikama, I think you'll be coming back very, very soon. I hope so, Jack. Thanks, and the best of luck to you, Mr. Hector uh, Thebus. Thank you, Jack. Thank Goodbye. you so much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, highlights from next week's exciting true story adventure. We follow an adventure partnership to the four corners of the earth on a global safari. Mr. Martin McGowan and his son John of Glenview, Illinois, begin their journey scouting Arctic polar bear by small plane. Next, South America and a trek through Mato Grasso jungles for a risky visit with Chavante Indians. The McGowans are photographers, so Africa follows to find menacing hippos and fighting elephants. In India, the McGowans track down man-eating tigers using buffalo trained like bloodhounds. I'm sure you'll enjoy our adventure next week. 
My thanks once again to Mr. Hector Thebus of Bogota, Colombia, as always to you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls.